So it would be nice to have that list posted someplace. Yeah. Yep. That's all I had. All right. Get on your run. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. All right. Next question from the chat. Can you explain explain the meaning of the PAX symbol on University of Acadia website, please? Okay. Um, so uh, uh, what we're looking for is the uh, – let me have a look, because um, I'm not quite sure that, that – um, can you tell me what the, the PAC symbol? Um, uh, Jeanette, can you expand on that, which symbol you're talking about, please? Yeah, I'm just sort of looking. I mean, there's lots and lots of symbols. It's just um, trying to work out what what they actually mean on that. Let me have a look uh, so I can see it and just have a quick squeeze. So, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I got it now. Okay, so it's a three. That symbol is the... Uh, symbol that was chosen uh, in the creation of what they call the Rorick Pact, and it's named after, allegedly named after, a uh, Jesuit priest um, that uh, created a document that united the universities of the world uh, to recognise each other and protect their interests. The pact itself is kind of weird because it is effectively a global unilateral military pact for the protection of universities between um, different nations, which is kind of odd because you would, you would kind of question why would nations commit their military forces to the absolute protection of education facilities? And I believe the answer is to what the universities actually represent in nations with the way the world is divided now since the United Nations has been created. So there are levels. I'll give you an example. At one level, the Lend Lease Act of 1941 treats the world without borders um, in the sense that it allowed American corporations to ship materials to the Soviet Union in clear breach of other statutes by simply dissolving the borders and as if it was shipped to a local address. So it may well be that the Rorik Pact was created in order to um, view the world as one giant um, set of universities. We've put that symbol there under the University of Eucadia because the Rorik Pact in its most generic form um, aids protection to Eucadia and there is nothing superficially that would suggest that the Rorik Pact in any way is negative for the University of Eucadia. But the administrator put it up there and that's what that symbol means, so those three dots. And I presume it means a trinity. Um, now, the symbol also apparently had some history dating back into um, China and Japan and is one of the symbols of power similar to the uh, yin and yang. So that's my knowledge of that symbol. And uh, if you want to know more, then please write to the administrator of University of Ucada, and I'm sure he will fill you in some, some more. And if you want, we'll make sure that there's a, uh, a link in the forums where some of the background to the symbol can be placed for anyone that wants to find out more. All righty? All right. I think that would be great. Uh, maybe some of the, ma the uh, main symbols that are used in Acadia would be, uh, would be a neat thing to have over there on the University of Acadia. Pretty informative and helpful for folks. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Frank. Uh, next question over here. Let me just check the phone lines real quick. Got several on the chat still if you've got, still have a few more minutes of time. Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, concerning the public notice, uh, what about using a public 
notary as a process server service to a public office, for example, like the county clerk for the purpose of notice to uh, one's position standing station on the land. Okay. <clears throat> the, the problem with public notaries is that outside of America, public notaries almost are entirely uh, solicitors. And in many cases, uh, they're extremely expensive. And even more so, in many cases, they will outright refuse to um, use their notarial powers for general documents. So it really places people in a disadvantage if the remedy is solely based on notary. However, one part of the system that is universal is that the town clerk or the council clerk uh, is the registrar of the uh, court of public record and this seems to be a universal uh, adoption in the system. So whether one is in England, Australia, Canada, America, uh, this seems to be a standard procedure. So I, I do think that there is um, a benefit in looking at different options depending on the, on the nature of the documents. As always, there is a risk of, of, uh, of doing too much or is a risk of, of, um, of people um, going off and doing their own thing. What I'd like to see when we talk about the remedy that we've still got to get up on the system is that we give people options. So, for example, if you are in the States and you do know a notary, then a simple remedy would be to get the notary to uh, uh, witness and obviously hold certain documents in public on the, uh, in, due, in due course so that it is uh, on the record, public record, and then, of course, uh, get that further um, time stamped uh, into the county recorder's office, and that then is perfection of notice and uh, constructed notice. So there are, there are different options, and what I'd like to do is see that we can give people a range of choices wherever they are in whatever jurisdiction. So, uh, Makiz, uh for that question, I think, yeah, I think it's um, um, a great idea. If you, if you have access to a solicitor or anyone who is a public notary and providing the documents sent to them is not going to place themselves in any jeopardy uh, or their, their office in jeopardy, I think that the public notary is a very, very powerful office, still is. So, yes. That's helpful, uh, Frank. And another um, possibility of furthering the record, we've discussed this a while back, we haven't really discussed it lately, is actually setting up an evidence jacket within the court because that is also, like you said, the court of record. And so those documents could actually be set up in a miscellaneous file that's called an evidence jacket. Uh, yeah, within the court. Absolutely. Now this is, we haven't really done much work in terms of the registrar of the Court of Public Record being the town clerk or the county clerk or the council clerk as to um, the different procedures. But there is an abundance of material there that we haven't really sifted through to look at efficient recording. In their system, it is more appropriate to record at the lower level first than it is to go to the top. For example, there is in Washington a quarter of deeds, a very important role, a very powerful role within their commercial apparatus. But it is more appropriate to try with the town clerk or the county clerk or council clerk first than to go to the top. So I would like to spend more time on this and with a number of people and, and see what uh, clarity we can provide to people. And part of that would be yes to see that a file can be established uh, for ongoing uh, recording and service. Yes, right. I think that would be right. very good. All right, wonderful. All right, next question we have over here from the chat. As general executor, do we still sign with BC and then the same, uh, it, well, then the name, or do we just write BC general executor? Or uh, we didn't really continue or complete that conversation a little bit earlier. So with a, a document that would be autographed by the general executor, 
um, we covered that just a little bit and whether or not it was thumbprint or uh, and witnesses. But what if one does actually sign? Uh, you have any recommendation or thoughts on oh. using BC or the R? Sure. Okay. There's two. There's two. Uh, and I'm going to answer, there's a question down below in terms of um, thumbprints in blood, so I'm going to answer that bit as well in this as right. well. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. There's two broad categories of signing. There's signing where you are able to exercise your free will, and then there's signing under duress, under constraint. So let's start with signing under constraint first, and then we deal with signing under free will. So under constraint is when you are compelled to sign for any kind of action to take place. For example, when you uh, send registered mail, when you lodge a document, when you put in an application, uh, when you are, are brought before a court, in any fashion where you are compelled to sign and if you don't sign, no action will be taken or... Uh, they will force you to do something. So in all those cases, uh, normally they will not even permit you to sign for, uh, Francis or Frank uh, full stop. They would uh, force you to put your name or appear to put a signature. When you are forced under constraint to make a signature, one would, I hope, one would not say, I'm going to put VC and, and, and throw it in their face. Instead, one would uh, sign Franco Collins in some script and make VC, V dot C dot, as part of that signature so it's clearly visible. And if they looked at the V dot C dot, because they monitor calls and they're getting wiser, and they say, no, 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 and they throw it up and tase you, whatever, then you'd put the three ellipse. But you would try your level best to make sure that your signature had some visible sign indicating that you had to make that signature under constraint. Now, that, that is done in the capacity of obviously, obviously executor, and you would not put Francis R full stop because you're not agreeing to it. You're being forced to do it. And that is why you use V dot, C dot, or the, or the ellipsis, which is the three full stops. Now, if you are able to sign of your own free will, that means it's not under constraint, then the only time, let me repeat it, the only time you would sign is if you are granting a right, you are granting some property or you're a witness. Now, if you're a witness, I would use a thumbprint. Uh, if you're granting a right, I'd use a thumbprint and probably sign your first name in R full stop to make absolutely clear because your thumbprint will be a seal and your first name, your Christian name, your first name in R full stop would be your signing as well. That is the only time you would sign. In all other cases, you would not sign. So if I'm sending a notice on the back of a summons and rejecting, not only would I not sign, I would make absolutely certain my name is not listed at the bottom. Because if you type your name, you write your name, that is considered a signature. Look at the definition. Now, as to thumbprints in blood, from June the 12th, the day of illumination this year, all blood seals, blood signs, blood oaths, inheritance, claims in blood are null and void. And they're null and void because the age of Mithra has ended and no one can claim blood as a, a claim of right or a claim of authority anymore. And the reason the age of Mithra has come to an end is one, we recognise and honour that history has come to an end. And number two, in their system, several thousand documents were sent perfected in blood and the global system dishonoured it. And because the global system dishonoured it, no matter what their excuse is, it doesn't matter, uh, the claims of blood no longer apply. So I hope I've answered that under constraint, free will, 
and why we don't sign in blood anymore.